Hello, everyone. Welcome to Peace of Authenticity Podcast. I'm Aubrey. And I'm Jordan. And we are the Andersons. In 2020, the Lord really challenged us on starting our own podcast. And so we invite you to join us on the journey of following Jesus every day. So let's grow together and learn together. (laughs) What's up, everybody? Hello. We are back. We're back. Yeah, so we got really busy last week, and so we, we weren't able to mm-hmm. record a pod. So for those of you guys that are upset, I suggest you walk in forgiveness. Or just stay upset. <laughs> yeah, <I'm just> <laughs> yeah, So, but we're so excited about this new series that we're going to do. It's, it's probably going to just be this one and the next one. We don't know Maybe yet. Maybe one more. Maybe. Who knows? So stay tuned with us. But it's amazing because we're going to talk about... One of the coolest characters, in my opinion, in the Bible. Um, we're going to be talking about Moses, a uh, dude that did incredible things because he was led by the Lord yeah. the whole time. But um, I hope that you guys are ministered to by this as much as we have been, as we've been researching it. It's been really incredible. Yeah. But we're going to begin at Exodus chapter 3. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to fill in all the rest of it later. So just yes. hang with us. But we're going to start in Exodus chapter 3 right now, verse 1. And it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he laid, or he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. So verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. We're going to stop right there just for a second because in those four verses, some very powerful things just took place. And yeah. the first thing that I wanted to touch on was the simple fact of the bush was on fire. Yes. And so if you guys do your research, you will understand. Here's an incredible fun fact for you. A burning bush in the desert in Israel is not uncommon. It's not crazy. It's it's not as crazy as you guys might think that it is. It's so hot and it's so dry. While we were in Israel, our... Uh, Israeli guide, Mm -hmm. um, Yehuda, actually told us that it happens quite frequently. He's seen one. Yeah, he's seen one. Um, Like while he was just walking through the desert, he was a desert survivalist type dude. And so he said like the hoof of an animal walking by striking a rock can cause a bush to... electricity. Static electricity, you name it. So the I used to think growing up, I was like, man... He just came up and this bush was like burning. Yeah. Like that would be scary. Like you're in the middle of the desert. That would be a crazy sight to see. But shepherds in the Bedouin culture, right? Like we already talked about. If you watched our other podcast, you know we talk, We spent a whole podcast talking about the Bedouin and, and how they lead their flocks into the desert. So for Moses, this wouldn't have been mm-hmm. a crazy sight. But what got his attention was the fact that it wasn't being consumed. It wasn't burning up. It wasn't burning up. It was just burning. So when he sees this, he it really stops and it makes him think, what the heck is going on here? Because that's not burning up. There's something different about this. So I have to go check and it out. And like you would think even like why the Lord chose a burning bush, right? Something that could have been a normal-ish thing in the desert, right? So Moses has probably seen it before in the 40 years that he was in the desert being a shepherd. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the Lord, what it took was for him to look a little longer and then to notice, why is that not burning up? And then when he got closer, the Lord Mm -hmm. called him. Instead of the, the Lord could have just called him while he was with his sheep, didn't have to have a burning bush, didn't have to, but like, Moses stopped. He noticed something that was kind of normal. Yeah. And he looked a little longer. And then he's like, there's something different there. So I just got this connection that through our day-to-day life, it could look normal. It could look mundane. Look a little longer because maybe the Lord wants to show you and you have this mm. moment that will forever change your, the course of your life. You don't yeah. know. I think we get stuck in the mundane and the normal and... 
So look yeah. at your burning bush a little longer. Yeah, I would I would venture to say what one of the main things that I learned on our study trip to Israel mm-hmm. was the simple fact that God moves in more practical ways yeah. than what we think that he does. He uses everyday ordinary things mm-hmm. to speak I mean even as as ordinary as using a donkey to speak to Balaam like he did in the in the <laughs> old testament yeah. I mean it's like it, it, he uses things that are normal that are part of everyday life but it's like he switches it up to where Wait, that's not. I didn't to expect that. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it goes back to our episode of where we talked about the grafting of the olive trees. Yeah. When when Paul uses that reference, he takes something that Familiar. everybody in the audience that he yeah. was preaching to would have understood, and then but God showed him a way to flip it up on its head, just as we've been grafted in a wild olive tree to the cultivated olive tree god is now using a burning bush which moses would have probably seen many times yeah. but now it's different because god is light he lights it on fire but then nothing's happening to it it, it, it kind of even points me forward to shadrach meshach and abednego and how mm-hmm. they were in the flames and they, they didn't burn up they didn't even smell like smoke yeah this is the first reference of the the bush being in the fire and so that's what God used, something that wasn't uncommon, but made it uncommon in that moment to get Moses' attention. So I would say the first point that we want to make on the podcast today is God will use something in your ordinary life, Mm -hmm. but see, one day he might flip it upside down to where you think, wait, hold on, that's not supposed to be this way. Something's different about this. That might be a moment that God is saying, hey, I want your attention. Mm -hmm. So look closely and see what what God is trying to say. Yeah, and then after that, the Lord calls him twice. He says, Moses, Moses, and then Moses says, here I am. Yeah. And so when you look in the Bible, seven other different times, no, six other different times, because this is one of the seven, there are times where the Lord has called someone's name twice. And so, you know, uh, I'll just name them so you can go and investigate yourself. Um, Abraham, the Lord called his name twice. Moses, as we're talking about here. Jacob, Samuel. Martha, <laughs> I love that story, mm. Peter, and then Saul slash Paul, but he said Saul. Um, and it, there's always, there's a connection to all of these different times where the Lord has called their names twice. And usually it is inviting them into a new path. It's calling something forth out of them. Mm. And so obviously this is, this in this story here, it's a huge calling forth because he's going to say, hey, remember that place? Um, that you fled from, well, you're going to go back and you're going to do this huge thing and something, uh, even back to the burning bush really quick. I, I saw like maybe a connection that Moses could have seen. Maybe the Lord showed him. I don't know that the bush was burning, but didn't burn up that the Lord would put Moses back in the fire, but he wouldn't burn up. Hmm. It might have, it could have been, uncom- it's obviously uncomfortable going back to Egypt because of like the past, the whole issue with him, yeah. you know, killing the um, the slave driver, mm-hmm. Egyptian, and having to flee because the Pharaoh literally was like, you're going to die for that. <laughs> and so he's like, okay, I'll leave. And it wasn't a pretty leaving, you know, and, and the fact that the Lord called him to go back and not just go back, but to go back and speak for him. And, you know, Moses saying like, I'm not good enough, pretty much all these things that will tell the Lord. But the Lord has called him. He said, Moses, Moses, I have called you to do this. And it's just amazing because it's always a direct divine call. Mm. Um, And the Lord will call your name twice. Um, And and what's amazing is, by the way, I don't know if like everyone knows this or not, but Moses was 80 years old when the Lord called his name twice. Moses had lived two totally different lives in the first 40 years of his life and then the second 40 years of his life, which we'll get to dive into a little bit more. And um, because this... um, podcast episode is called preparation because you'll see exactly how the Lord has prepared Moses for what he has called him to do by saying, Moses, Moses, I need you to do this. Yeah. Yeah. So the Lord is basically saying, and and I know um, there's probably some that are listening to this podcast right now that are thinking, oh my gosh, 80 years old dudes, you know, <laughs> yeah. dudes should be retired, you know, should be, you know, taking it easy. But one thing that I w- like, I will say that Brad 
Gray told us while we were on that Israel trip is like one of the most powerful statements he said when he was teaching on Moses is Moses is a clear defining um, character that proves the fact that God does not believe in retirement. In the and so yeah. in the kingdom, right? Like I'm saying, you you can you can work a job, right, and retire. Like I'm not. That, that, you have I'm some not, people yeah, like what? yeah, the people are like, wait, I'm retired. Hold on, oh, no. no, but but in a in a real sense, right? You can you can work a job for a certain amount of time, and yeah. you can retire. You know, you've you've built wealth. You've you've you know set yourself up good. You can retire from your job, but when but kingdom minded people never get to retire. Yeah, because. Moses was 40 when he fled Egypt and and became a Bedouin mm-hmm. and he became a completely change of a lifestyle then the Lord had him do that for 40 years just to come back for yet another 40 years because the Bible tells us what what verse is it is it in Acts where where the Bible tells oh. us that is that the one let me see here. Where it says, Moses died at 120 years old. That's in Deuteronomy. That's in Deuteronomy. So mm-hmm. 120 years old. And and I love it there because the Lord broke up each segment of Moses' life in into 40 yeah. years. And and so yeah, this is this is a define like a divine and defining moment oh, yeah. with Moses because the last time when he fled Egypt, it was a part of God's plan, but God didn't tell him to flee. Now this time, God is basically saying go, go back. <laughs> go back because there is something that only you can do. Yeah. And what we're going to talk about in the next episode that, that's going to come next week is exactly how prepared Moses was to take on what he was about to face. But in this moment, in Genesis chapter 3, he had no idea. And I can imagine, if you're listening to this right now, I want you to think about the most uncomfortable place that you've ever been in. Maybe it's a place or, or maybe it's around certain people. Right, and then think about all of a sudden you're sitting here minding your own business. You've put all that stuff behind you. It's it's forty years for Moses. Yeah. Forty years in the past, he's he's doubled his life since this moment. And then all of a sudden, God is going to tell you, "Hey, I want you to go back mm-hmm. and readdress that situation." I'm sitting here thinking, God, like that would be the yeah. worst. Well, because if you remember. The reason why Moses killed the slave drivers because he saw injustice. Yeah. So he had a heart for the Hebrew people. He had a heart for the Israelites. And the Lord knew that. So he fled with that heart for them. And I'm sure it still kind of bothered him those 40 years after, like knowing that they were still suffering. Yeah. I really think the Lord built his heart um, for them and grew his heart for them with the empathy and, you know, even being away. And so I just think it's really a beautiful a redemption story of him going back. And yeah, yeah. Being I'll, able to help free them. Absolutely, and and that's that's the thing. Um, the Lord was steady preparing Moses yeah. the whole way. Very steady preparing. The the first <laughs> forty years of his life, the next forty years of his life, all was building to what some might call the final act. Yeah, which was the last forty years of his life. Everything was building there. But Moses didn't know that. Just like you and I, we don't know that. But slowly behind the scenes, everything that you go through, God is building um, different skills, Mm -hmm. different abilities, different experiences, building all that up for something because at the end, it's all going to bring him glory. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the main things that we're learning about Moses right now. But I wanted to read just a little bit further, if that's okay. Yeah. Do, do we plan for that? We're going off script We're maybe right now. We're just going with it. But, so uh, we read through verse 4. Moses says, here I am. Okay? So then the Lord says, then he said mm-hmm. in verse 5, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. All right? So mm-hmm. verse 6 starts this, and he said... I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Mm. Um, I, I I think that it's amazing because every time God reminds us of who he is, he, he lets us know his resume. Mm-hmm. Because he says, not only to, to, am, I, am I just your God, Mm-hmm. I'm the God of Abraham. 
I'm the God of Isaac. And they and they I'm told the God their stories. Jacob. He knew. Yeah. He knew exactly who he was yeah. when he said that. So it was like just a reminder that was like, dude, I, I, God doesn't have to prove himself to mm-hmm. us, but I love it in these moments whenever God's like, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because then it's a constant reminder to all of his children exactly what he's done up until that point mm-hmm. and gives them the courage to keep And then walking. after the Exodus, you'll realize the Lord says, I'm the Lord that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, so, so the Lord is not only building up Moses to tell him like, Hey, Moses, I am, you know, I'm going to do this for you. You know who I am, all this stuff. He's, he's charging Moses up to take on this task that he's about mm-hmm. to take on. But the Lord is also building a even bigger, more impossible resume for his children because we're about to see, this is one of the, the miracles that sets in. This is one of the events that you learn about in Sunday school. Some of the very first things that you learn about the miracles of God, we're building up to those moments right now. And so the Lord is kind of getting Moses to a place where he's ready. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love it that Moses it hid his face for he was afraid to look. Which is so funny because later on Moses' face, because he spends so much time with the Lord looking at him, and that his face is a glow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so he doesn't always hide his face from the Lord once he knows him more. But in this instance, he's like, oh yeah, my he's hiding his face because he, he understands the situation that he's in. He has a healthy fear of the Lord and a reverence and a, and an astonishment for the mm-hmm. Lord right now. But so verse seven goes, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. We've already touched on this Mm -hmm. before in the podcast as well. To the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, yeah, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, all the ites. They're Mm -hmm. all in there having a party. They're all there. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression uh, that the Egyptians oppressed them with. Come and I will send you to Pharaoh. I'm going to send you back into that situation that you don't want to face, that you ran away from. God is sending Moses back in there. And so uh, I'll send you to Pharaoh to bring the children out of Egypt. He said, but I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. But I want to skip down because Moses then kind of reacts in fear, like many of us do when the God, when, when the God, when God calls us out, or if God tells you to face a situation that you don't want to face, or anything like that, we all have fears that try to rise up within us in that moment. And I love this because Moses is like, I'm not qualified for this. Like, I don't know. And, and so he, he raises this question. Who do I say sent me if everybody looks at me like I'm crazy, mm-hmm. right? And this is one of the things that, that is powerful because in verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So God just gives him this blanket, just I am. Okay, but see, if if you'll actually dive into what that means, right, and you'll do a little bit more research um, behind, you know, into the Hebrew and and everything like that. I just read an article before we did when we were doing this podcast where that would be better translated as um, I am present. Like God is basically telling Moses, not only am I going to be with you, so he's telling Moses, I am, right? I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be present with you, but I want you to tell my people who are facing all these injustices and everything that I'm going to be, I am present with them too. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first time where we get this glimpse of the Lord that, you know, uh, the Bible says he's alpha and omega. Like we we get this, this, um, he's omnipresent. He's with us in our, in our time of need. And so I, I see this and I go, Uh, you know, the Lord saying, I am present. And it immediately made me think of Hagar Mm -hmm. when uh, Abraham, right? When he was, they they got frustrated because Sarah wasn't conceiving Isaac yet. So Abraham 
um, sleeps with Hagar, the sla- the servant girl, mm-hmm. and produces Ishmael. And so then once Isaac comes along, Hagar runs away because she's afraid that she's going to be killed, right? And so um, in that moment, in the midst of the desert, Hagar, the servant girl, is sitting there and and she's wanting to die, basically. And the Lord meets her right there in that moment. And she gives the Lord the title, the God who sees me, Mm -hmm. you know? And so we had that from the beginning. We knew that the Lord saw us, but this is where the Lord tells us that I am present with you. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of sets the stage for all the other gods of the world are like way up here. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is saying, Moses, I'm with you. I'm present with you right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, whenever you were reading what the Lord told Moses he was going to do through him, I thought about even what Moses' name means. It mm. means draws out. And at first, what I, what I first realized is, oh, wow, the Lord you know, drew him out of Egypt into the wilderness and then drew him back into, you know, and I was, I was thinking of that wording, but ultimately the Lord, the main reason that Moses was prepared and alive was to draw the Israelites out of Mm. Egypt. And so don't question what the Lord has put in you from the day you were born, before you were born, before you ever thought of by your parents, everything like that. And, and, you know, I really, I used to always be thinking that we were, I was here for one specific huge purpose, right? I think that's in a day-to-day thing. I don't think, you know, for some people it could be, I mean, we see this with Moses, right? But then he had 40 years in the desert with the Israelites. So every single day he had to, you know, (laughs) Like, draw them out again, draw them out again, you know, and like connect them with the Lord and all these different things. And honestly, we build up these purposes for it. It's going to be the most fulfilling, most amazing Hmm. thing that has ever happened to me. Do you think Moses felt that way when the Israelites kept saying again and again, like, this sucks. I'm going back to Israel. I'm going back to not Israel. I'm going back to Egypt. Or um, we're worshiping this God now. Or um, no, we don't want to talk to God. He's scary. Why do we still have to eat manna? Oh my God. You know, Mm. like, like, do you think that is what Moses dreamed of at night for his ultimate purpose? Like, you know, like to deal with so many people. The Lord has, they had seen all these signs, all these wonders. The Lord has them in the desert. They can't act right. So they're there for 40 years and Moses is stuck with them for 40 years. And then at the end, Moses doesn't even get to go into the promised land. I'm just saying. I think we build up our purposes and like with these expectations that are like the most glorious, amazing things that could ever happen. But is it really how it's supposed to look? Because I feel like, no, I don't think it's how it's supposed Mm. to look. There are definitely moments, right, to where you're like, wow, it'll be fulfilling. I'm sure it was fulfilling for Moses, but it wasn't perfect. It wasn't, oh. The build up to this is just everything I ever <laughs> wanted. You know, yeah. I I just really don't think that that's the thing. But the Lord took him on a journey of a lifetime, preparation for eighty years for a forty year journey. You know, in, in the desert again, him leading people like a shepherd, and it's just it's just a beautiful thing to get to see that. And so, yeah, his name has a lot of meaning to it and to draws draw out. out. Yeah, mm. yeah, I'm I'm saying that you, you were. You were talking about all that stuff about purpose and you know and how we build things up in our minds. I can't imagine uh, Moses. If if you read back to chapter one, which I encourage you to do, I think we all know the story. But Moses, for the first forty years, was royalty. Mm-hmm. He grew up in the palace. He he had servants. He had slaves. He had. Um, anything that he could possibly want was at the tip of his fingers. Yeah. Or, you know, if he didn't have it, somebody would go get it in yeah. one, you know, three, two, one. And so for the next 40 years, for him to transition into that Bedouin mindset. Which if you haven't, I should have said this at the beginning of this episode. Go ahead. Watch our previous podcast to know more about the Bedouin because we yeah. were able to go in depth with that. But. Yeah, absolutely. The Bedouin way was the, was the last podcast that, that we found. And, and so you actually find out in chapter two 
um, a little bit into that. We weren't going to really go into this. Oh, but, yeah, go ahead. But I think it's it's crazy because um, it's, it says Moses flees to Midian, all right? And so now let's not forget he was royalty mm-hmm. up until he killed this slave driver because he thought this slave driver was whipping and, you know. He saw injustice. He saw injustice and he rose up. And he killed this guy, and I'm not. Don't do that. Like don't if you see, do it. yeah, if you see injustice, don't rise up and like <laughs> you know kill somebody because you you know think you need to. But um, so it actually tells us um, it, it was crazy because he flees Egypt and he goes and he shows up to this watering hole. Right? That's that's mm-hmm. that's, that's right. Yeah, well. where these where these girls are trying to get water for female their, shepherds. Female shepherds. There we go. So. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna mess with that. That that could be something else. What were you gonna shepherds. do? I was gonna say, you know, for for everybody that you know thinks that certain things are man, you know, a man's job and certain right. things are women's. This is a perfect example in Exodus that there was female shepherds out here making it work. You That's know? right. Um, so anyway, they they're they're trying to get the, at the watering hole, and these other shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and he saved them. This is in um, chapter two, verse seventeen. And Moses stood up and he saved them and watered their flock. So these other males were being mean to the females. Yet again, Moses is showing us his sense of justice. Mm -hmm. And so he stands up. But so then the daughters go away and they go back to where their father is. And um, so then the father says to his daughters, they get home and they tell their father what happened. And so the priest of Midian, Jethro, says to his daughters, "Then, then where is this man? Why why have you why have you left him? Call him that he may come and eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man and even married one of the married one of his daughters. Mm-hmm. But you see that hospitality that we talked about mm-hmm. in the Bedouin Way podcast that this guy steps up and, and the, the girls just go back home and then they tell their dad what happened and their dad was instantly upset. Like, mm-hmm. why didn't you bring this man? Like, because it was an honor to have yeah. guests, especially if that guest helped your daughters, mm-hmm. you know, water the flock or whatever. So we actually get a glimpse of the new life that Moses was about to take on because he married into a Bedouin family. But we come back to that subject of purpose. I can't imagine that being on a downgrade from living in the palace to being a shepherd in the midst of the rocks in the desert of, you know, by where Moses was, that couldn't have felt like an upgrade. Oh, no. It it couldn't have felt like, oh, my gosh, I've been waiting my whole life (laughs) to be wandering around with sheep and goats in the middle of nowhere. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I imagine that in the palace, he probably got to bathe whenever he wanted. They, they, he probably smelled a whole lot better than oh when he was a Bedouin and everything like that. But, but God was slowly using, he was using the first 40 years and the next 40 years to get him to the place where God needed him to be. Not where Moses wanted to be, mm-hmm. but where God needed him to be yes. so that he could use him for the next step. And we're going to get more into that in the next episode. But um, I think you should read that that quote. Um, the, oh, the one I wrote over here. Yeah. Um, God doesn't radically change our path like we think. He brings us into who we are working to be the whole time. And, and I love this too. It says God is more interested in who we are becoming than what we are doing. Mm. And I think we get so set in what we're doing. I mean, I think we automatically think like that. Maybe just as Americans, I've just grown up realizing that the do, do, do is like what most people are looking at. Yeah. But the Lord cares about who we are becoming. We can be doing all the right things, but who are we becoming? So in this instance, Moses is becoming the man that is going to draw out the Israelites. Mm-hmm. You know, who the Lord calls Moses, Moses. So he's, he's about to fulfill what his name means. Exactly. But in order to get to the place of of walking out what his name means, he had to go through a lot of junk. And so, um, you know, I think that, I think that that's incredible to, to understand that he went from being a prince to a Bedouin and that felt probably like a downgrade, but God is not interested in what you're doing. It's more about who you're becoming. And that goes back to what we were talking about in our Good Shepherd podcast before about the difference between sheep and goats. God cares more about your obedience and willingness 
to go from Prince to Pauper, you know, or Prince to Bedouin, because he's trying to teach you something in both those seasons, because act three is going to blow Moses away, and he doesn't even know what he's in store for, and that's what we're going to get into in that next episode. But I wanted to touch on just one more thing before um, before we call this episode quits, and, and it goes back to what we read earlier. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, God says to Moses, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. When we were in Israel, there was a segment of one of our teachings where Brad made everybody in our group take their socks and shoes off. Now, if you understand, we've posted some videos about it, but if you understand the terrain of Israel, you understand that there's rocks everywhere. Mm-hmm. It's It would never be comfortable for you to walk around with your shoes off. And I imagine that this place where the burning bush is, where Moses is with, with his flock, there's probably rocks everywhere. And so, I mean, his feet were probably a little bit tougher than mine because he had to wear sandals. Mm-hmm. Um, but even the sandals were an upgrade from being barefoot. Now, that you know, we talked about that a second ago. That the Lord used His voice in a burning bush when the Lord could have just caused like an earthquake or something to get Moses' attention, but He did this on purpose. He goes, "Don't come any closer to me. I want you to take your sandals off because this is holy ground." And so Moses was standing there on the rocks on a terrain that probably was not comfortable for mm-hmm. his feet getting these instructions from the Lord. And I imagine this conversation that unfolds through the rest of chapter three, we are getting a very condensed version, I believe, of the actual conversation. So I would say that Moses was standing on the rocks in his bare feet for a long time. Also telling the Lord, this is uncomfortable, but maybe not physically, but what you're asking me to do, I cannot do this. Also in his (laughs) mind, he's probably sitting here thinking, well, Dear God, I just wish I could have <laughs> kept my sandals on. You know, like the, the, these rocks aren't comfortable because I remember having the same feeling as Brad was trying to teach us as as we were in that teaching. And I'm standing there and it's hard. Like you have to constantly keep shuffling the weight from yeah. foot to foot because it's like, ow, this one's starting to hurt. So I got to switch. But but Moses is having a conversation with the Lord. and But what, what that taught me was um, in, in that teaching where we were barefoot, we were standing on the rocks. It really was not comfortable. It really kind of sucked. Mm-hmm. And um, we learned through that that you know a lot of times when when I'm guilty in my prayer of of asking the Lord to show me the path or show me the way to walk or even an inner belief that the Lord is going to make the path smooth. And, you know, oh, if it's the Lord, then everything's going to work out fine. I should be able to, you know, walk through the path barefoot and it be fine. But what this showed me in the midst of this conversation with Moses is he was standing on the rocks. It was not comfortable. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have been comfortable. But it was holy ground. But it was holy ground. So that led me to the place of understanding. And I've been told this several times. Brad Gray said it. Brad Nelson has said it to me, um, the two guys that were that were leading our trip. But our prayer and our focus should not be, Lord, make my way straight or make my path straight, make my life comfortable. Do you know? Because that's mm-hmm. what our, a lot of our prayers have to do with. Oh yeah, is like, Lord, please, I, I need, I, I want your favor, I want your grace, I need your mercy, and these are all true things that we need. But the better heart is to pray not lord change the path to fit me but lord make my feet tough enough for the path that i'm walking down Mm -hmm. or make my feet prepared for the path that you need me to go on Mm -hmm. because see the difference of that is you're wanting god to change everything around to fit your style to fit your comfort in the other way says, Lord, make me comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Make my feet ready for whatever you have. So then that way, when the things get rocky, when the Lord asks you to go and approach somebody or go to a place that you're very uncomfortable with, like Moses is facing right now, 
you can stand there barefoot on the rocks and talk to the Lord and not be comfortable, but know that you are on holy ground. Yeah. And even you can see foreshadowings mm. um, of what the Lord had for um, Moses whenever he was born and everything that was going on. And so one of the first things I want to um, show you guys, it's really cool, a foreshadowing of what the Lord had prepared for Moses is in Exodus 2, 1 through 2. And it's pretty much just saying that um, at that time, Pharaoh decided there were too many Israelites, they were going to overpower them. So what we're going to do is any little boy that's born, throw them in the Nile. The girls can live. I don't know. Like it was just horrible. And so that's what was happening. Moses's mother had him and hid him for three months. And then, um, so it, it says that right after she had him, she looked at him. And in some translations, it's translated a little wrong. It says like she looked at him and he was a fine child or something like that. But the actual Hebrew, con the Hebrew wording for it is she saw that he was good. So that takes you back to the creation of the world in Genesis because the Lord saw that it was good. It was good. And that's what he said after he made man. So it says in the same likeness that Moses' mother looked upon him and saw that he was good. And then the next thing is um, the the basket, right? So they call it a basket. They say, you know, she made a basket out of papyrus and asphalt and uh, something else, uh, pitch to make it waterproof and, and made this basket. Well, the actual wording is ark and it's the same exact Hebrew word that was used in Noah's ark. And so it's just very cool to see like the foreshadowing here because let me read this for you. It's so good. It says, Noah's Ark is very much supposed to be linked to our minds with the tabernacle and all the things, you know, that happened later in the, in the desert. Okay. But equally, Moses' appearance in his Ark foreshadows Yeshua slash Jesus, his presentation in a manger because Moses was a prelude to the Savior to come mm -hmm. because Moses was to draw the Israelites into freedom out of slavery, which is what Jesus did for us. And there's a lot more connections with Moses and Jesus. It's amazing. And something that I saw with all those connections is that look back at what the Lord has done in your life. Look back at what the Lord has taken you through, what you have gone through, and really like just see the preparation that he's done. Don't always be looking to the future like, what's my purpose? What's my purpose? What am I good for here? What do I need to do? What does my five-year plan look like? Which those things are great. But looking always to the future will rob you of remembering the things that the Lord had done in the past and mm -hmm. seeing his strategic yeah. um things that he has done in, in, you know, your past and preparing you like what we we're talking about. So, yeah, I, I think that, that, yeah, that's, that's a really good point that instantly made me think of God. God did not start out by telling Moses, I'm going to send you yeah. into Egypt to do a, B and C. He goes, I, he didn't say you're going to go to Egypt. There's going to be all these plagues. Mm -hmm. because of you, yeah. you know, like I'm going to have you do all this. He didn't give him all those yeah. pieces to the puzzle. Many of us, when mm -hmm. we pray, we want God to lay out everything A, B, and C. Um, mm -hmm. If Moses knew what he was about to take on, he probably wouldn't <laughs> oh, have gosh. went. He, yeah. he probably wouldn't have went. But what, what God does, and what Jordan was saying just a second ago, that was such a powerful picture to me, because I instantly thought of this conversation between the Lord and Moses. And, and the Lord instantly says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So his resume has nothing to do with, I need to show you what I'm about to do in your life. Mm -hmm. It's always about, look yeah. what I've done mm -hmm. before. Yes. And so it, it kind of reminded me of one, of another one of the teachings that, that Brad taught us in, mm -hmm. in Israel where he said, when, when we're trusting God, it's like walking forward, but we're facing backward. Mm -hmm. Right? God always reminds his children of who he is through what he's already done in the past. Like you should know my resume based yeah. off of what I've already done. So as we move forward, we don't need to be looking to the future as, as like for, okay, God, where are you at with it? And I'm guilty of this every single day. Oh, Lord, just show are. me, just give me a glimpse of what's coming. Yeah. But what we need to do is understand we need to be like Moses to where we're moving forward. Moses had no idea what he was doing except go. Mm -hmm. He knew where and he knew what he was supposed to do. Just go into Egypt. That was it. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. That was it. But God, in throwing out that resume, always says, 
This is what I've done in the past. That's why it's so vitally important that we remember constantly what God has done and not constantly look for what he's going to do or something like that because he always explains himself through what he's already done and you you can see that. And the Lord listed his resume, not not Moses's. Yeah. Don't forget that too because I think we obsess over our resume and what we can and we can't do. Moses had enough of that when the Lord told him what he was going to do. But the Lord said, this is who I am, and that's what matters. Yeah, Yeah, so today, there we have it. We're talking about the preparation of Moses. And so now we are, next week, we're going to be talking about the the connection. Mm -hmm. Why Moses? Why was Moses the perfect man? to take on what we're about to learn and even in the upcoming story. If you didn't think the plagues were already pretty horrible, we're going to help you see them from the Egyptians' point of view. They're way worse. <laughs> yeah. This is why context is so cool. <sighs> but yeah, anyway, guys, we're, we're so thankful that you guys continue to support us. Mm-hmm. We, we love each and every one of you guys. If, if you need prayer for anything or anything just really reaches you, don't ever hesitate to hit us up on social media. Um, if you want to support us in any way, those words of encouragement go a long way, letting mm-hmm. us know that that God is is using what He's taking us through to to help each one of you guys. But um, I hope you enjoyed today. But we'll we'll be mm-hmm. back next week, same time, same place. We'll see you then.